Stand with us, please. We're going to sing, Glorious is Thy Name.
Well, good to see all of you here today. I'm glad you braved the rain. I feel like we're back in Costa Rica during the rainy season, the way it's been around here. The only difference is it's cold here, but it was warm there. Just good to see you out. And uh, what a great beginning we had this morning with these great songs and the opportunity just to talk about the glory of God and to sing and to proclaim His glory. So I'm glad that you're here to do that. If you're here this morning as a visitor, welcome. We're glad that you're here. Please take one of these cards that you should find somewhere in the pew there in front of you. Fill that out. Drop it in the offering plate so we can just have some more information. If you've got a special prayer request or something, uh, be sure and, and put that on there so that we can know about that. One thing I will mention this morning before we stand and, and shake hands is the uh, that there will be a meeting this morning if you're interested in the mission trip to Honduras following this, uh, this morning service in the chapel, uh, meet in there. Even if you've just got some interest, you'd just like to know about it, then it would be a, a time for you to do that. Stand for just a moment and welcome one another, greet one another. be seated. I want to uh, uh, recognize Jeff this morning for just a quick word to kind of bring you up to date uh, for the pastor search committee. He just has a couple of things that he'd like to mention this morning and then we want to pray for them. Thank you Dr. Golden. Trying to keep you all uh, as informed as we can as we go through this search uh, that our search committee is going through at this point. Uh, I do want to share with you that we are beginning to zero in on a candidate right now. And any of you that have ever served on a pastor search committee, you know how that goes. It could, we could be getting really close or we could be getting, uh, we could be starting over. <laughs> so I just want to let you know that we are beginning to focus our attention on a particular candidate. And the reason I share that with you is we're at a critical time right now in this process where we need everyone praying right now. We need prayer for God's direction. We need prayer for clarity for our committee as well as this candidate and his family. And uh, I just uh, want to ask this morning that, and I asked Dr. Golden if he would lead us in a special time this morning of prayer, that you would keep this process in your prayers. Uh, we're focused on where God's leading us and uh, we trust that this may be the direction, but we also know that God can take you down paths sometimes to, to change direction. So uh, I, wish I, I wish I could tell you we're there, but we're not. But we are focusing in on a candidate. So please keep us in your prayers this week. Keep this candidate in your prayers. And uh, I want to ask Dr. Golden if he could uh, lead us in a special time of prayer this morning. Yes, I will do that. And let me mention one other thing as we remember this group that is so diligently searching. Uh, Russ Dugan, who works in our media at The Sound, uh, fell off of a ladder this week and was very seriously injured. So um, uh, we'll miss him and we need to be praying for him. That's kind of a, a part of our ministry that we don't see. We don't see the people that are behind that and doing the work. But if it were not for them, this wouldn't happen a lot of times and wouldn't get done. So be sure and be praying for him as well. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we... We do come to you this morning, Lord, on behalf of this pastor search team. And God, you, you know all that's going on. You know their hearts. You know the, the heart of who they're talking to and, and, and all of the <coughs> process that they have gone through to get to this point. And Father, I, I trust, I believe with all of my heart, they're looking to you for guidance. And Lord, we want to just together this morning as a church body lift up their 
uh, efforts lift up their hearts to you, God, that you would continue to work in them, to work in their lives, in their minds, in their <coughs> hearts, Lord, that you would guide them. And Lord, as Jeff said, this may or may not be the nearing the end of that search, but Father, you know all of that. You're in control, and we ask you to continue to be in control. For the Lord. Lord, give them diligence, give them wisdom, give them patience if that's needed, but God, help them to know exactly what your will is. We just ask that. And Lord, we pray for <coughs> Russ this morning uh, in his injuries, and we thank you for his ministry here. And God, there's, there's others. There's, there's a myriad of names and people, Lord, that are hurting this morning, perhaps physically, perhaps mentally. Lord, it may be a heartache and it may be a problem with the body, but God, there are people who we want to pray for. And Lord, we, we think of that long prayer list that we have on Wednesdays that are and, and they're out here, Lord, that uh, on the desk that people can pick up and look at. God, we just pray for those who, many people would just love to be here today and they're not able to. So we pray for them. Lord, thank you. We commit this service into your hands and ask you, God, to do in it and in us what you want to do. And we thank you, Lord, in Christ's name. Amen. <clears throat>
Let's pray this morning. Our Father, we know that you are a great God. You love us, Lord, when sometimes we can't love ourselves. You forgive us and we continually sin. So when we come to you this morning, we thank you, we love you, and we ask you to be with us, Lord. We ask you to be with this church. We ask you, please be with our committee that's searching and please find the right person for us. Now go with us this day as we give our offering. And it should be a blessing to us to give because you said for us to. And Lord, we ask you to lose this, use this monetary gift for your church and for saving other people. Go with us, lead us, guide us, and direct us. In these things we ask in the name of Jesus. Amen.
some 50 years ago, I uh, had surrendered to the ministry and was getting the opportunity to preach various places. Sometimes it would be a church, usually a small church out in the country somewhere. Sometimes it would be a camp site. We would go and spend the night, sleep on the ground. I'd preach and take the kids, of course, and they'd get their mosquito bites and all the different stuff that goes with that. And uh, I basically had one sermon, and it was on love. And that's become a family joke now because any time the kids, you know, ask me, what would you preach on, Dad? Someone will say, he preached on love. <laughs> that was the only sermon I had at that time. But uh, the thing about it is I'm still preaching on love. Now, maybe not every sermon, but uh, it's still a theme that I, I, I don't know. How do, you, how do you get away from the love of God? You, you just, you can't. If you know God, then you know his love. If you don't know God, you hear about his love, and people talk about it, and hopefully those who know God will show that love to you and, and to others. And I began last week uh, talking about the love of God. Well, I, I didn't get through, and who knows, I may not get through today, but uh, we're going we're gonna to talk about that s- some more today, the love of God. Turn in your Bibles to 1 John chapter 4 beginning with verse 7. Now this, of course, is, is not nearly the only place that it talks about the love of God. Tim, do you see a Kleenex or something somewhere? I saw a box of some somewhere. I need to, to, I need to thank you. Otherwise, I'm going to be sniffing up here all morning and you're going to be wondering what's going on. So turn in your Bibles to chapter 4 of 1 John beginning with verse 7. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent His only Son into the world, that we might live through Him. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected or completed in us By this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and testified that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. So we have come to know and to believe that the love that God has for us. God is love. And whoever abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. By this is love perfected with us, so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment, because as he is, so also are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. We love because he first loved us. Let's pray. Father, we thank you this morning for your love. It's it's something, Lord, that we cannot fully express in words. Lord, all the words fall short, and and this morning as I stand here to attempt to talk about your love, Lord, I'm well aware that we can analyze and 
we can explore what your word says. But Father, only in you, with you, by you, and through you can we experience that love. And so Lord, we ask you this morning to, by your spirit, touch our hearts with your love. And Lord, I know that there's many here today, hopefully everybody, that knows your love that has experienced your love. Lord, help us to not just understand it more, but to let it do more in us and for you to work in us, Lord, that we would know more of you and know your love even deeper and more. And Father, would be willing and anxious and glad and active in exploring that love and sharing that love. Father, take control. Lord, we thank you already that you're here because we've had a, a great experience of worship this morning, Lord, and, and I pray, God, that you would just continue to, to work in us today. And we thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I talked about last week about the uh, description of God's love. It's a gracious love, an unconditional love, a sacrificing love, and eternal love, and then a personal love. There's one more part of the description of God's love that I want to begin with this morning, and that is that it is a disciplining love. Now, that's maybe one we don't really want to hear about. We, we like the gracious love, the unconditional love, the eternal love, the personal love, and all those. But when it comes to this thing of disciplining, we'd really rather probably not even hear about that, much less experience it. But what we need to understand is that there, there, there is this state of being in the family of God and for those who are the children of God, there's disciplinary action in life. You remember the definition that, that I, I gave uh, last week, and let me read it one more time because uh, it's something that we need to remember. This is uh, given by uh, Zodiatis in the Complete Word Study Dictionary. It says this, the definition of agape love. It is God's willful direction toward man... It involves God doing what he knows is best for man and not necessarily what man desires. Keeping that in mind, it involves this discipline then, involves God doing what he knows is best for you and not necessarily what you desire. There's probably not many of us that would walk around saying, God, discipline, in, discipline me. God, Help me to uh, not do what I do wrong anymore, but let, can we do it in a way that's not painful? It's like, you know, it's like the child says, I'm not going to do it anymore. I promise I'll never do it again. And then, you know, they forget about it. it it's this discipline that God gives us is because of his love. It's because of what he cares about us. It's because he wants us to be what he, is, he has created us to be. Hebrews 12, 4 says, My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. Listen, for whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. And then verse 11 says, Now no chastening seems to be joyful for the present but painful. Nevertheless, afterward, afterward it yields the, pens, print, uh, the, excuse me, the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. What God is doing in us when he disciplines us in various ways is training us, helping us to learn, not just from a book what is right, but in experience what is right and how, how we're to live. And I think sometimes we have this idea uh, that 
to show love, and many who want to show love assume that to love someone is to make everything as easy for them as possible. Make sure they don't want for anything. Make sure they get everything they want. Make sure they're never uncomfortable. And that would be fine if we weren't human. If we were just a, 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 an object upon which they could lavish their affections and, the, and their attention. That's kind of the wonder of, of baby dolls. Now, I didn't play with baby dolls. Uh, I think now maybe Webkins is the, is the thing that's this big. I don't know. That may be passe too. But, but uh, what I had, you know, some, some kids have imaginary friends. Any of you, how many of you had an imaginary friend when you were young? Ah, uh, you won't admit it, but you did. I had, I had a goat, an imaginary goat. And I would tie that goat up, tie him to a tree, you know, out there in the, in the yard or in the lot. And my cousins that I spent a lot of time with, and, and they were all older than me, they loved to untie my goat. Make me so mad. They were always untying my goat. They still laugh about that. Well, you remember when we untied your goat? Well, there's no need for discipline or teaching with an imaginary friend or with a, a baby doll. There's no need for boundaries or limits because that doll can't make any decisions. That goat did exactly what I wanted him to do. But isn't it interesting that children come to that place in life where they, where they actually tire of the dolls. And, and they want something that's, that's, that's real, and they develop relationships with, with real people, creatures that, that have personalities and, and who have thoughts of their own and who have opinions, who don't always act nice or respond favorably to your desires or your ideas. And see, here's the thing. God didn't make man merely as an object of his affection, a doll to play with. When he made man, he created him in his own image and breathed into him the breath of life. He, he put in the man a heart and a mind and, and a soul. And we have the capability of responding to God or, or we can resist God. We can obey him or we can ignore his commands. We can follow his guidance. Or we can make our feeble attempts at, at independence and do what I want to do. But God hasn't just proclaimed his love. It's one thing to say it, but he's shown it. He's demonstrated his love to us. God, God's love is, is seen in, in Christ's sacrifice. In verse 10 of the passage we read earlier, in this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. God demonstrated his love in sending Christ and, and Christ making that sacrifice. God's love is seen in, in, in Christ's substitution, 2 Corinthians 5, 21. For our sake he made him to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. There was an exchange Christ took our sin, and we took his righteousness. God, he substituted for us on the, on the cross. God's love is seen in Christ's salvation. We see in verse 14, and we have seen and testify that the Father has sent his Son to what? To be the Savior of the world. 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19 says, Knowing that you were ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. Ephesians 1, 7. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. So we have the, the, the demonstration of God's love to us, not just saying it, not just written somewhere, but he has shown us, demonstrated to us his love. Well, what do we do with that? What's the disposition of, of God's love in us? You, know, you, can't, you, know, you can't love in a vacuum. You, can, you could say, I guess, well, 
You know, I just love. What? Who? What, do you, what follows that? You, you, you've got to have an object of your love. Love, love must have an, an, an object. And so when God's love is in us, when, when the love of God is present in the life of a believer, it will be visible and, and, and be active. There will be love for God. Why do we love God? Because He first loved us. It's not measured by feelings, but it doesn't exclude feelings. I think we feel love. But there's no way we can measure that love just by our feelings. Matthew 22, 37, Jesus said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. What, what does that mean? It means we're striving to honor God. Not out of fear, but from love, we honor God. We strive. We want to please God and, 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 and honor Him. So we, we have a love for God. We have a love for, for the Christ of God. If you love me, keep my commandments. It's shown in the steadfastness of our, of our love. It, it continues on. Uh, turn over to uh, Revelation chapter, uh, chapter 2. Verse, well, beginning with verse 1, actually. Revelation chapter 2, verse 1. It's the letter to the church at Ephesus. To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks among the seven golden lampstands, I know your works, your toil, your patient endurance, and how you cannot bear with those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and found them to be false. I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake, and you have not grown weary. That sounds pretty good, doesn't it? That might describe First Baptist Athens. It might describe a lot of churches. But then he goes on. But I have this against you. Oh, what is it? That you have abandoned your first love. But we're doing a lot of good stuff. Yeah. But why are you doing it? What, what's your motive? You have abandoned your first love. This steadfastness that, that we have in the love of God. Not just when it's easy. You, uh, how many of us would... Probably, if, if, I, if I were to ask you this morning, you, you probably would, would say that you would not deny Christ under pressure. I think about that sometimes when I think of these places and these countries and these people that are in other countries that they, they often have a choice. They can deny Christ or they're, they're going to die. And I think, what would I do? I don't know. We don't know what we would do. I think I would stay steadfast. I, I think that I love God and love Christ enough that I, I would not deny Him. But I don't know. You say, well, look what all I do. Well, Jesus talked about that. He said, you know, you've got people who say, you know, I've, I've preached in your name, I've ministered in your name, I've done all this in your name. And Jesus will say, never knew you. I think sometimes our, our steadfastness, our, our stick to itiveness, our dedication is tested and, and, and shown where we really are sometimes. I, I've, we've, we've just gone through Valentine's, and last week I talked about some of the Valentine's messages. I read this uh, uh, in one of the, the Valentine's uh, websites and that kind of thing, but. Uh, this, this young man was writing a letter to his girlfriend who lived just a few, few miles away in a nearby town, and, and he was telling her how much he loved her and uh, how wonderful that he thought she was. And here's what he said. Uh, really, the more he wrote, the more poetic he came. And finally, he said that in order to be with her, he would suffer the greatest difficulties. 
He would face the greatest dangers that anyone could imagine. In fact, to spend only one minute with her, he would climb the highest mountain in the world. He would swim across the widest river. He would enter the deepest forest and with his bare hands fight against the fiercest animals. You know, we might say something like that about Jesus and our faith in Jesus. But then it says he finished the letter, signed his name, and then suddenly remembered that he had forgotten to mention something quite important. So he added as a P.S. I will be over to see you Wednesday night if it doesn't snow. How much of our love is conditional? As long as it's easy. A lot of that, I think, has to do with what we, how we get, how we learn, how much time we give, but also how much we really get into the done for us and how we rehearse that and think about it, sing about it. These songs this morning, wonderful songs about the love of Christ and loving Him. And so one of the, the ways that we express our love and show our love is, is, is having a love for the, for the Word of God being active in reading the Word and studying the Word and learning the Word. Psalm 119, verse 9 and following says, How can a young man keep his way pure? What does it mean by his way? Well, it means the way he goes, by guarding it, his way, according to your Word. In other words, live according to the Word of God. With my whole heart I seek you. Let me not wander. I, that's an interesting word. Isn't it? Let me wa not wander from your commandments. I'm convinced that's how most of us typically end up breaking a command or living in a way that is short of how God would have us to live. We don't just, most, most Christians, sometimes we do. Sometimes we just say, I'm going to do this. I don't care. I don't care what God says. I don't care what God's Word says. I'm just going to do it. It's what I want to do. But a lot of times we just kind of wander. We're not concentrating. We just kind of slip into something or wander into violating one of God's commands. This goes on and says, I have stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. In the way of your testimonies, I delight as much as in all riches. I will meditate on your precepts and fix my eyes on your ways. A love for the word of God. And I believe as we learn of God and as we learn more and more about God, then we will have a love for the worship of God. To come together and worship, or just to worship even individually, just worship God and praise Him and thank Him for all that He's done for us and for His love for us. The Bible's clear in Hebrews 10, 25, it says, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another. All the more as you see the, the day drawing near. David said in Psalm 122, 11, I was glad to go to the house of the Lord. Do you wake up on Sunday morning glad that you get to go to church? Boy, what if you couldn't go? What if you're laying in a hospital bed somewhere or laying in a, in a home somewhere, a care home or, or in a rehabilitation place or in a country where you, you, you couldn't go? And we've got this blessed privilege, this, this right even, to get up and go to church, worship God and praise and sing His praises. What a blessing it is. And then love for the church of God. 1 John 4, 20 through 21, right here in this passage. If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he's a liar. For he... He who does not love his brother whom he has sent, seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, whoever loves God must also love his brother. Verse 12 says, no one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. Love for the church of God. When the saints walk in love, God, God will be seen. John 13, 35, by this all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. It 
since we're talking about the church, and since we're talking about love, and since Valentine's Day is just past and we're still kind of in the throes of that, I still read my Valentine's card right there on my desk. Let me just mention this, and I should spend a whole lot more time on it, but I, I do want to mention it since we're in that, that vein of loving. God has compared the love of Christ the love that Christ has for the church to the love a man should have for his wife. 5, 25 through 29 says Christ loved the church and a man should love his wife in the way that Christ loved the church and what did he do? He gave himself for it. George Bernard Shaw, who is not someone I want to quote as a, an authority or a Christian or anything like that, but he said this, he said, the vows of two people, the vows that two people make at a wedding, when two people are under the influence of the most violent, most insane, most elusive, and most transient of passions, they are required to swear that they will remain in that excited, abnormal, and exhausting condition continuously until death do them part. I want to tell you, George Bernard Shaw missed it. Dead wrong in what he says. Unfortunately, that's what so many of us think. And we make those kind of vows in the, in the emotion of a wedding, and we don't even think of the significance. And it is precisely because those feelings don't always last that we take those vows, no matter what comes in sickness or in health, in riches or in poverty. So often people come to me, marital problems, going to get a divorce. And so often their words are like this or something like this. We don't love each other anymore. You know what? Unfortunately, that's usually true. But I want you to hear this. Often people don't love each other anymore because they don't love each other anymore. You know what I mean by that? Remember that love is an action. It's not a feeling always. It's an action. It's how we treat people. And so often in marriages, we forget that part, and that part gets left behind, and so before we know it, we're not feeling this romantic love. And so they say, we don't love each other anymore. And my advice to them is start loving each other. Start loving each other in action and in caring and in showing love to them. Well, that was parenthetical, but I think very, very important. Maybe we'll elaborate on that some more. Lastly, love for the enemies of God. Jesus had a heart for sinners. Jesus said, love your enemy. You look in Matthew chapter 5, Verses 43 through 47. Let's look at it right quick. Matthew 5, verse 43. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. You may be, son, be sons of your Father who is in heaven, for he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? God, as God loves us, His love is in us. We're going to love those maybe we don't like, or those that oppose us, or those that we might even count as enemies. So finally, here's what it is. 
How do we do that? Well, God's love is supernatural. It's something that is beyond us. We can't do in ourselves or of ourselves, but God does it in us because He has loved us. He shows us what love is. So His love is supernatural. It's sacrificing and it's, it's satisfying. J.I. Packer in his book, Knowing God, said this. He says, what matters supremely, therefore, is not in the last analysis the fact that I know God, but the larger fact which underlies it that He knows me. I am graven on the palms of His hands. I am never out of His mind. All my knowledge of Him depends on His sustained initiative in knowing me. I know Him because He first knew me and continues to know me. He knows me as a friend, as one who loves me, and there is no moment when his eye is off me or his attention distracted from me, and no moment, therefore, when his care falters. This is momentous knowledge. There is unspeakable comfort in knowing that God is constantly taking knowledge of me and watching over me for my good. There is tremendous relief in knowing that his love is utterly realistic based at every point on a prior knowledge of the worst about me so that no discovery can now disillusion him about me. In the way I am so often disillusioned about myself and quench his determination to bless me. Because God loves us and in his love for us, he has a purpose for each of us. He doesn't just use us like a doll and then cast us aside or put us in a storage box somewhere only to be forgotten. He loves us personally. And for those who accept that love, He has promised to complete His purpose in us. It may not always be comfortable, but it will always be for our good. And we can know that. Remember the definition. It is God's willful direction toward man, God doing what He knows is best for man. Why? Why would He do that? Because God is love. And a love affair with God will never end in heartbreak. You'll never be disappointed in God's love. So, let me conclude with Psalm 107, 43. Whoever is wise, let him heed these things and consider the great love of the Lord. Let's pray. Lord our God, Lord, thank you so much for your love. Thank you, Lord, that you didn't just love in word, but you love in deed. And you love with a love, Lord, that is just beyond what we can imagine but Lord not what not beyond what we can experience Lord we thank you for that we thank you that in Christ we can know your love and and we can see your love and we can experience your love and we can share your love and God that can overflow into family friends people around us and Lord, we give you the glory. We give you the praise for your love for us and help us, God, to love others. And now, Lord, there may be people here this morning that don't know that love. You know, you know, you know every heart here. Lord, that have not experienced your love for them. Maybe they're just acting on a legalistic basis or a religion basis. But God, they don't know you. Lord, I pray that they would today, that they would experience your love, that they would accept and receive you as the Christ, the Lord, the God of their life. And in that, know your love. Lord, we thank you for that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And we ask that you would stand and sing and let God speak to your heart. And as he does, you respond as he would lead you. Oh, to see the dawn of the darkest day, I 
morning as you leave, I hope you leave knowing you're forgiven, knowing the love of God that is paid for our sins and your sin personally. Tim, would you dismiss us? We have a closing chorus. We'll sing uh, from There is a Fountain. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel. Thank you for joining us this morning. First Baptist Church of Athens, Tennessee meets every Sunday at 9.30 a.m. for Sunday School small groups and 10.45 for worship. For more information, please visit fbcathens.com.